know what's funny is this episode occurs entirely in the past. Do you know how rare that is in Star Trek? Well, not counting the new stuff, which I haven't watched, it's only ever happened one other time. That would be in Stormfront and Enterprise. Go we'll figure. <sighs> this is an episode written mostly by Art Wallace, although Roddenberry was very heavily involved in production, and also did writing for it himself, obviously. And Mark Daniels was directing it. And you ever heard of the Quester tapes? Yeah, me neither. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I've never actually looked into them, and I don't really plan to. This is a backdoor pilot. Allow me to try and explain what that is very, very brief for those of you who are not aware of this, because a backdoor pilot is when you already have a show running, and you make a pilot in that show for another show to piggyback into starting a new show, okay? Now, this is either incredibly sensical and very logical, or nonsensical and stupid, depending on what angle you're looking at it from. No, seriously, think about this. You have all of the equipment, personnel, uh, cast, crew... Uh, you've got the lot to record in. All of the stuff that you already need to rope together to make a pilot is already there and available and budgeted for. So you can just make a new launch pilot. Excellent, right? Perfect. Cool. Here's the catch. The other side of things is that you are being rather insulting to the existing audience if you, and not really going to be pulling in a new audience unless you do it very, very properly. Uh, I think it was Mr. Justman who flat out said, anytime you have a backdoor pilot, it has to serve two masters. It has to be a good episode of the existing show and a good episode of the new show, and that is a very hard balance to make. Not impossible. But the point is, if you fail on that balancing point, not only have you screwed yourself over for the future show, but you may have actually damaged the existing brand. Remember, by the way, that shortly after this episode came out, Roddenberry left to go work at MGM and started pulling two salaries. Yeah. Robert Lansing does what he can as Mr. Seven, but he's kind of a really boring flat character. Uh, I'm not sure what else to say about that. It's not, that's not the actor's problem. In fact, to be completely blunt, the only thing that really salvages this episode for me is Terry Garr. Now, yes, I am a fan of her because, I mean, she's an awesome actress who's done some amazing things over the years, including, of course, young Frankenstein, uh, but also, you know, Close Encounters of the Third Kind and a few other dozen things I could mention. You've probably seen her if you've seen anything from this era. She was in a lot of stuff, both in TV and in film. She just also happens to be here. Allow me to tell you the in-depth story of her... No, okay, here's the thing. Uh, there's, you've probably heard the tale that she was not fond of recording on this episode. I actually did some research on this. I managed to track down an interview by her, which I have here. This is the totality of the interview about Star Trek. It, it, she was interviewed about other stuff. But the only time Star Trek was mentioned, she said this, and I quote, I have nothing to say about it. I did that years ago, and I mostly deny I ever did it. Um, thank God it didn't get turned into a series. Otherwise, all I would get would be Star Trek questions for the rest of my natural life, and probably my unnatural life. You ever see those people who are Star Trek fans? The same people who go to swap meets. I have no idea what caused her to be so vitriolic towards this. It was Gene Roddenberry. No, I, I don't actually know. The only thing I do know, and this is actually kind of a, a disconnected thing, was the fact that Roddenberry insisted her skirt be shorter. That's it. That's all I got. And while that's just kind of, okay, that's kind of pig, a pig, that is a pig-like attitude that's pig-headed? I don't know what to call that. It's gross. Okay, let's just call it what it is. But that's it. Like, that, that's a relatively minor thing. So why was this such a horrible experience for her? Of course, that is her right not to talk about it, and I'm not going to pry any further, but I did try to do my due diligence on this one. It is a damn shame, because I stand by what I said. She is the only bright spot in this entire episode. Let's talk about the main plot, a.k.a. the Gary Seven plot. So, first of all, we go back, have casual time travel, and the whole ship shakes from inter intercepting a transporter beam, which I'm not even going to get into that. They then have a lot of really awkward dialogue, because Roddenberry doesn't know how to write dialogue, and then Kirk brings up a very valid point. You know, we have no actual proof of who or what Gary Seven is, so we don't actually know if we should go along with this. So, he's not antagonistic, and that is worth noting. Kirk is just hesitant. It's like, well, okay. 
you know, super powerful, seemingly alien shows up in the 20th century. Not a time traveler, by the way. Seven is from that era. K kind of. He's not a time traveler, though, is the point. So, okay, sure, we, we need to figure out what the heck is going on. Seven, of course, is having none of this, and he treats this as a situation where he has to ex escape. There's also, you know, I've, I've commented on this before, there's a lot of situations in Trek where someone says something like, oh no, or whatever, over the comm unit, and you know what the other person on the other side is? Come in. Come in, report. What's going on? Captain, report. What's going on? Captain. Captain, Captain, what's going on? Captain, report. Captain. This happens so freaking often, it's actually kind of silly. It's not always to Kirk, too. It's just a really weirdly common trend. Like, I don't know about you guys, but if I was on the phone with my sis, and I suddenly heard, ah, yeah, I wouldn't be like, sis, are you okay? More than maybe twice. The next thing I would be doing would be calling 911 while rushing to my car and blitzing over there. Now, it may be nothing, but that's not how that works, right? You don't rush, you don't have emergency procedures for the everyday. You have it for when you actually need it. So yeah, I'd treat that as seriously. And if on the drive over there she said, it's okay, I slipped, I'm fine, then I'd feel silly, but I wouldn't regret what I did and I would do it the next time too. And I'm just an idiot who cares about his sister. What's with these professional military personnel who have just this weird, stupid discipline of, all right, Captain, you seem to sound like you were under attack. Maybe you could continue talking to me. I'm just going to keep saying it. Anyways, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. So then they expose it, and then they expose it, and then they expose it, and then they expose it. A lot of really dry, boring exposition in this episode. You could say, well, it's a pilot episode. No, seriously, the exposition is really dry in this episode. And then he pulls out the sonic screwdriver. I did my research on this one. The Sonic Screwdriver first showed up in Fury from the Deep. Uh, that doesn't sound right. Isn't it Fury from the Deep? No, it's Fury. I, I wrote that down right. Fury from the Deep. It was a Doctor Who episode. Uh, the second Doctor. Which, I knew this because the second Doctor is actually my favorite Doctor. So I was just like, I remember that. Now, it didn't do all the things back then. It was just you know a screwdriver. But nevertheless, that's when it first showed up. March 16th, 1968 is when that episode went live. Now, unfortunately, I do not know when that episode was written and conceived, and all that fun stuff. This episode went live March 29th, 1968. Now, that's a hell of a coincidence. I do know when this episode was conceived, which was quite a bit earlier, months and months earlier, October 21st, 1967. Just curious to look at that. A lot of people have compared Gary Seven to Doctor Who, and to be completely honest, it would not surprise me at all if the Seven Adventures series that was intended was at the very least inspired by Doctor Who. It's a good formula, so I'm not really throwing shade here. It's just interesting to think about. The only thing that makes me raise an eyebrow is that sonic screwdriver, but that is such a tight window there. I'm not sure where to lean on that. Either way, the actual episode starts 11 minutes in, because the first 11 minutes is just, what do we do? This then leads to dry exposition. At least this is actually reasonably well done. This is probably the only good exposition in the episode where he explains that 6,000 years ago, humans were pulled out of this situation to be bred and served and trained to be super agents to help save uh, Earth. 6,000 years ago? Really? Why does it have to be? Whatever. The general idea is that people who are of this of the planet in question, of the time in question, are given super training and super tech to assist. If anybody is familiar with my setting, that does sound a lot like the Bastion, although the Bastion is obviously different, and I mean, I can name like three or four other organizations that do the same thing. But the point is, it's not a terrible idea. Okay, I'm kind of with it. We also... Uh, I... Then Terry Gar joins the crew, joins the, the show, and like I said, she's the best part of the episode by a huge margin. It's not even a question. <laughs> Probably my favorite scene, if I had to name a specific one, is when she's at the typewriter. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! <laughs> right. Seven then realizes he has inadvertently revealed a lot to her and is willing to pull her on board. And she ends up being a companion, <clears throat> an ally, Sort of, but also a hindrance. The problem is she's basically a guest star on the episode. Not as much as the main characters. Now, if you're paying attention, we're at like 14 minutes into the episode, right? I have two more notes about the entire rest of the episode. When I was reading about this and about the backdoor pilot, because it came up when I was discussing all of the stuff relevant to 
the season three renewal thing, right? When I was going through that. Uh, this is the wrong bookmark. I have so many bookmarks I'm keeping track of here. When I was going through it, I was like, okay, you know, that, that let's, let's go ahead and discuss this. And I found that there were several things here that specifically mentioned the difficulty with backdoor pilots. There wasn't much that I didn't already know, but it was still nice to read from an actual producer of television that I was right about how backdoor pilots function and why they are so damned risky. Um, unfortunately, it looks like I'm not going to be able to find the page in time because I'm already at the point where I want to talk about it. But the point is, they reached a point where they were like, okay, should we go ahead and make this a new series? And NBC said no. They dropped this like a ton of bricks. They were astonishingly disinterested in doing anything with this show. And as I was watching it, I had the weird thought in the back of my mind. Why? Like, what's so bad about it? What's so wrong about it? Like, what, what's, what's going on with this? I, I don't really understand the issue. <laughs> I don't understand what's so bad about it. But I've already told you, haven't I? For 40-ish minutes of television, I had nothing to say. Nothing. Because nothing happens. There's nothing interesting. There's no drama whatsoever. He effortlessly infiltrates everywhere. There's no real obstacles for him to overcome other than the Enterprise crew, and even that's a barely. I'll cover that in a second. There's no suspense whatsoever. The episode, the big th threat thing of the episode is, is Gary totally legit? And the problem is, we already know he is. We, the audience, have already seen him exposit on his nature as being here to help. It's one of the first things we see about him when the episode actually starts at the 11 minute mark. So there's no tension. This is just two people who are like, oh, what do we do? Now, that could kind of work. The tension being, will Kirk's indecision or making the wrong decision cause the problem? But the problem is Kirk is not a part of this equation. And again, I'll get to that in a minute. So for the actual episode of Gary Seven, there's no tension, there's no dilemma, there's no anything. This isn't even a major event for him. Th this is a major event for him, like going to the grocery store is for you or me, right? This is nothing. In fact, if not for you know one little niggle at the end, everything went completely smoothly. You'll also notice that, uh, oh God, Roberta, that's Roberta Lincoln. Uh, her, her character is like, I'm going, to, I'm going to stop you because I care and I want to pr try and save my country. And he's like, no, you have to help me. And she's like, I don't believe you. Seconds later, Kirk and crew show up and she's like, no, you have to believe him. He's totally legit. What? When, when did that transition happen there? Here's the problem. This episode, there's actually copies that you can find if you really dig for it, of the original script that are available. When I say the original script, I mean the original script of this show, not the Star Trek part. The Star Trek, episode, the Star Trek parts were grafted in very crudely, I might add, and the seams show in scenes like this. Then we have a sexy Isis Catwoman. I don't even know where to go with that one. And there's even this bit where they say, yes, we've discovered, like, they even hint that, oh, yes, they're definitely going to go off on tons of other adventures. We'll let you discover that on your own in the books and comics where he actually does continue to go on because he's never going to show up again in the series and neither is his secret planet of whatever. Like so much of Star Trek canon, it's just been completely ejected. One of the books I actually did glance through, I never actually sat down and did a full read, it was uh, him interacting with Khan. Yes, that con. Several, several years later, like 30 years later, I think, something like that. It was an interesting read because the point was he was effectively trying to recruit Khan and work with Khan, trying to limit, his, limit the kind of danger and damage he represented and did to the world. He failed, obviously. But in the process, he did make Khan less of a problem than he would have been. And he's also the one who ends up giving him the Botany Bay. Just interesting to think about. So what about the rest of the episode? This is the problem. This is not a Star Trek episode. Exactly 10 minutes and 32 seconds after the episode starts, so that's uh, 21 minutes and 21 minutes and 32 seconds of the episode, which is actually not a small amount now that I say that out loud, but hear me out, I am going somewhere with this, is devoted entirely towards the, the Star Trek stuff and not towards the Seven stuff. Okay. Now, here's the real catch. I bothered to write down not only each scene, but how many seconds each scene had. Yes, seconds, because each scene was interspersed. Like, I want you to imagine, because this is so nonsensical. 
Each one of these scenes has nothing to do with what's going on on the screen at the time. They found me. I don't know how, but they found me. And the further problem is every single one of these scenes is interspersed weirdly, progresses barely at all, and only lasts seconds. <sighs> Thank God the aliens were weak to seltzer water. So, as a direct consequence of this problem, we have a situation where it's just kind of weird. It almost feels like the episode's pausing itself to go do something else. Well, actually, I think there is a point at which our collective pedantry in somewhat contradictory terms is attributing to a high level of both ignorance and intellectual stagnation in our society. Uh, particularly as it pertains to common use of language in our ever-evolving vernacular. I believe that level of stubbornness imposes limits on the evolution of our own human expression. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the die-hard pedantic argument between nauseous and nauseated makes me both nauseous and nauseated. Rather than to actually focus on the action of the episode. And of course, what's really important is those events have nothing to do with anything whatsoever. Because, check this out. I wrote this down. First, they th get their costumes and beam down. 23 seconds. Then, they try to find where they're going. 22 seconds. Then, they try to triangulate. 31 seconds. Then, they find the office, but, uh, alas, they can't really do much there other than find it. 84 seconds. Then, they escape the traumatized cops by beaming out and beaming the cops back down. 73 seconds. Then, they look at the launch pad. 54 seconds. Then they are captured and still looking at the launch pad. 45 seconds. Then they're captured with no dialogue. 30 seconds. Then Scotty's looking at the launch pad. 9 seconds. Scotty finds Gary 7. 23 seconds. Scotty beams Gary 7. 20 seconds. Kirk makes a log entry. 18 seconds. And there's also three random reactionary shots, one of which lasts two, one of which lasts four, and one of which lasts six seconds of just them looking at the launch. Then there's a scene where they're debating what they should do, which lasts 63 seconds. Then they escape from, from the launch area for 27 seconds. And then they have their big scene for 106 seconds, where they're, they actually finally contribute to the episode by letting Gary finish doing what he's going to do. Now that should make it clear, but in the off chance I have to reiterate this, nothing happens in any of these scenes. They are irrelevant to the story in every single respect, except when they try to beam him away, and fail because she beams him away at the same time, so that accomplished nothing either, and then when they stop him at the end. So the only actual thing they do is stop him at the end. That's it. That is the only interaction they have with the story whatsoever. The other point I wanted to make, and I hope that little editing trick earlier kind of showed it as well, was each of those was very short scenes, and so it's like you have two or three minute stretches of things, and then it's like, I wonder what's going on over here. And then you have another several minutes, and then I wonder what's going on over here. And it's just really badly done, you know? And so season two ends. Wow. I, uh, I don't think this is lamentation worthy, unless you think of it from an out of, out of universe perspective, you know, real life perspective. But the hard truth is this, this is, bad episode. I am absolutely skipping this going forwards. Because even though it's inoffensive, it is dull as dishwater. Pass. I'm not sure I'm going to look into the Quester tapes now, given this. <sighs> Alright, guys. We did it. We made it to Season 3. <sighs> if I could say one thing before we actually jump into Season 3. I've always heard and read that Season 3 is the bad one, and that's where things kind of go wonky. I mean, Spock's brain and uh, Way to Eden and and The Children Shall Lead are all Season 3 episodes. But as a part of this series, I've been doing a lot bigger de detailed look and a lot more research on TOS than I've ever done in my whole life. And everything I've read has not put me in a mind to think that this is going to turn out well. So I hope you'll join me for it, and we'll see what we get, won't we? Wait, 
Before I go any forward, I've been keeping a list as we go here of VHS list and skip list and, of course, the lamentations. Let's just look at this really quick. We have 18 VHS episodes, which is actually a pretty damned good number for two seasons, and... 14 skip episodes, which includes the three lamentations. Whew, that's a hell of a ratio, isn't it? But that, that right there, reminds, once again, just proves what I already said is true, that TOS just does this in terms of quality. I'm, I'm going to make that graph when we finish TOS. I'm going to do it and see how this lines up. But for now, for real, I'll see you next time.